Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 15, The Pandavas Retire Timely, Text 41. Vacham Juhava Manasi Tat Prana Itare Chatam Mrityava Panam Sargam Tampata Tve Dya Jo Vavit Vacham Juhava Manasi Tad Pranamitare Chatam Mityavapanam Sotsargam Tampatantua Jahajo Havit Vacham Juhava Manasi Tat pranam itarai chatam Mityavapanam sautsargam Tampatyatva vyajo havit Chum. Speeches. Juhava. Relinquished. Manasi. Into the mind. Tad pranay. 
Tatrane. Mind into breathing. Mind into breathing. Itare. Cha. Cha. Other senses also. Tum. Tum. Into that. Mrityo. Mrityo. Into death. Into death. Apanam. Apanam. Breathing. breathing. Sautsargam. With all dedication. Tum. Tum. That. Panchatwe, into the body made of five elements. <coughs> he, certainly, a Jehovavit, amalgamated it. <coughs> Translation. So we're hearing about you, King Yudhisthir, leaving the body. Then he amalgamated all the senses, sense organs into the mind, then the mind into life, life into breathing, his total existence into the embodiment of the five elements and his body into death. Then as a pure soul, he became free from the material conception of life. Purport, King Yudhisthir, like his brother Arjun, began to concentrate and began, and gradually became free from all material bondage. First, he concentrated all the actions of the senses, and amalgamated them into the mind. Or, in other words, he turned his mind towards the transcendental service of the Lord. He prayed that since all material activities are performed by the mind in terms of action and reaction of the material senses, and since he was going back to Godhead, the mind would wind up its material activities and be turned towards the transcendental service of the Lord. There was no need for any longer material activities. Actually, the activities of the mind cannot be stopped, for they are the reflection of the eternal soul. But the quality of the activities can be changed from matter to the transcendental service of the Lord. The material color of the mind is changed when one washes it from contamination of life breathing and thereby frees it from the contamination of repeated births and death and situates it into the pure spiritual life. All is manifested by the temporary embodiment of the material body, which is a pro production of the mind at the time of death. And if the mind is purified by practice of transcendental loving service to the Lord, is constantly engaged in the service of the lotus feet of the Lord. There is no more chance of the minds producing another material body after death. It will be free from absorption and material contamination. The pure soul will be able to return home back to God. Hit Omagyan Timirandasya Genajana Salakaya Chaksun Militam Yena Swaisi Guravena Maha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pistaya Bhutale Srimakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pacharine Nirvase Sa Sunyamari Pasyati Ade Sutarine Panchakopa Tarubhischa Kripa Sindhu Pae Pacha Padita nam pavane bhyo vaishnavi bhyo namaho namaha Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadara Shiva Sadi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare hmm. So the mind, yes. Mm -hmm. So the pure soul has a, has a direct loving relationship with the Supreme Personality of Godhead eternally. But the mind gets in the way. <laughs> the rascal mind. It, Prabhupada said, it's not real, but it's very powerful. <laughs> the mind. And the mind can, as it says, he can make a heaven out of hell and a hell and a heaven. In other words, the mind can change anything to its own ideas. No matter what the external environment is like, whatever the mind reflects, that becomes the reality. 
But there is only one reality, as it says in the Bhagavad Gita. When you thus know the truth, you know that all living beings are my parts and parcel, they're in me and they are mine. That is the only reality that everything is, reflection of the spiritual energy, either directly coming in the form of the Brahma Jyoti, or you can actually say all living entities who are reflections of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who are trapped within the external energy of the Lord. The external energy of the Lord does not really exist, but it appears to exist. It exists only due to the consciousness of the living entity. As soon as one purifies the consciousness and comes back to one's natural consciousness of Krishna consciousness, material energy does no longer exist for that, con for that living being. But we have to deal with this rascal mind. It's a rascal because it's very difficult to control. It says in the... Uh, in the, in the uh, Srimad Bhagavatam, that the mind is your best friend and your worst enemy. One should elevate themselves by the mind and not degrade itself. The mind is the friend of the conditioned souls and the enemy as well. So wherever the mind is, that's where you, you're, you usually go. You can be sitting here uh, in Radhagopinath's temple, but you can be, you know, in New York City right now, thinking about what are you going to do when you go shopping? You know? <laughs> so wherever your mind is, that's where you are. Prabhupada tells the story how one, two guys are walking along. They're on their way to the prostitute's house. And uh, while they're walking along, they pass the kirtan party. So one of, them, one of the men said, oh, wow, there's the devotees. They're chanting and dancing. I'm going to go with them. I'm not going to the prostitute's house. So his friend says, well, I'm not going, I'm, going to, I'm not going with you, I'm going to go to the prostitute. All right, so they split up. One go so he goes to the kirtan and he's there dancing and chanting and his friend goes to the prostitute's house. And then after some time he gets tired of chanting and dancing and he starts thinking, hmm, you know, my friend is at the prostitute's house and he's having a really good time there. <laughs> And here, and then his friend who's at the prostitute's house, he's thinking, boy, what a waste of life I am. I could have been in the kirtan party making spiritual advancement. So you are where your mind is. <laughs> Although the external environment may have some influence, the consciousness takes you where into the, into the mood of the a present existence, and that's where you are. So that's the nature of the mind. The mind is like a... Now we can, sometimes we, people ask, what's the difference between the mind and the soul? Um, the soul is actually the person, but the mind is a creation of the material energy due to our association with that energy. And we create that desires based on that interaction with the material energy. And because of that, we use the mind in order to, and when we say live life, by accepting and rejecting uh, external or, uh, objects, or when we say sense, sense objects. But here's a good example. I like to ex always like to explain this: that the the soul is like an expansive, beautiful sky that is unlimited. Because when you see the sky, you think, "Oh, the sky is unlimited. There's no end to the sky," and it looks like it's eternal, or at least un unlimited. Now, you'll see within the sky, you'll see sometimes you'll see airplanes flying around, mm -hmm. you'll see birds flying, clouds are there in the sky, and sometimes different objects appear and disappear from the sky. So these different uh, imprints upon the sky are like the thoughts of the mind upon the pure soul. They don't touch the soul. <laughs> Just like the objects in the sky don't touch the sky, but they apparently seem to be in the sky, and being part of the sky. But actually, there's no connection at all. It's just from our point of view, it looks like they're connected. So in the same way, the, the thoughts of the mind have nothing to do with the actual existence of the soul. But because the soul identifies with the mind, the mind is the, it becomes the, what we say, to use a very simple thing, the CEO. He come, he's in charge. <laughs> and he takes us to wherever we, he wants to go. 
Sometimes we can control the mind, but most of the time we can't. <laughs> because it's just the nature of the mind to reflect the desires within the heart. Therefore, as long as there's material desires in the heart, the mind becomes impossible to control, at least focus in devotional service. So we see here with um, Yudhisthira Maharaj, he's gradually winding up his material existence and amalgamating all of the different aspects of his, his physical and um, subtle aspects into the mind. And then after he puts everything into the mind or absorbs all of these things into the mind, then he directs the mind towards the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And in that mood, he disappears from the world, and that is perfection. So um, it's important to understand how, how uh, to control the mind, because without controlling the mind, there's no, process, there's no progress in devotional service. But it's very difficult to control the mind. In fact, it's impossible. Uh, it seems impossible. When Arjun said to Krishna, you asking me to control the mind? I think it's like trying to control the wind. It's very unsteady, turbulent, uh, very difficult to control. Me think, and then he ends by saying, if it's easier to control the wind than it is to control the mind. And after explaining his uh, situation, Krishna says, Abhyasena tukunte vairagena chidriyate. He says, yeah, you're right, <laughs> but you can do it. How? By constant practice and detachment from material activities. As long as we have any material desire, we cannot make progress in devotional service. Progress in devotional star service starts when we, make, when we actually are free from any attachment to the material desires. Now, does that mean you have to be free from all material desires to make progress? In one sense, yes, but in another sense, what it actually is saying is that as long as you don't act on your material desires, although you may have them, you just don't try to feed them or try to satisfy them. You have to somehow or other d divert your attention away from the pushings of the mind and the senses and even the intelligence that works with the mind in order to connect with the senses to try to find some happiness in material contact. And gradually, when we removed ourselves from the activities of the mind towards the material energy, then we can stay fixed in devotional service and gradually purify the mind. But before you purify the mind, you have to purify the intelligence. Because the intelligence is the directing. You'll see sometimes in the Bhagavad Gita, there's a nice little picture and it's a very graphic and very descriptive picture of the nature of the living entity in the material world there is a chariot and on the chariot there's two living entities one is the passenger and the other one is the driver the driver is holding the reins and there's five horses the horses represent the senses the reins represent the mind the uh, the driver is the intelligence, the passenger is the soul, and the chariot is the body. And so the passenger, the soul, is being dragged away by the chariot of the body, directed by the, the mind. So when the mind is controlled by the intelligence, and so the intelligence comes from what? Shastra, from guru. So by hearing regularly from guru and shastra and understanding that knowledge, applying, then one can use that knowledge in order to keep the mind focused on the activities of devotional service. Because we see, you see the example of Sabari Muni. Sabari Muni was a great yogi. He could meditate underwater for extensive periods of time. But because he wasn't fixed in devotional service, although he was very uh, adept at the process of yoga, he hadn't come to devotional service yet. But because the power of his own uh, yoga, he was able to meditate underwater for long periods of time. But then, just by the arrangements of the material energy, two fish started to copulate together, and he started 
to watch that. And then he became attracted to that, gave up his whole yoga process, and got married and had 50 wives. <laughs> Just by washing fish engaged in sexual activity. So, although he was so adept in yoga, because he was not engaged in higher understanding, in other words, devotional service, the mind can at any mind time be diverted. We have the example also, which is the most uh, prominent example given in the scriptures of Vishwamitra Muni. Vishwamitra Muni was defeated by Vishishta Muni. Vishishta Muni was a Brahmana, and he had defeated Vishwamitra Muni. And Vishwamitra Muni could understand, Vishwamitra Muni was a, a Kshatriya, that Brahma Tejas is more power than Kshatriya Tejas. In other words, the Brahman is that they can actually control the Kshatriyas. We have the example of how the Brahmins killed King Vena when he was acting licentiously and irreligiously. The power of a pure Brahmin, just simply by chanting mantras or giving out curses, can do very effective, powerful things. Uh, they could put out this powerful energy and they can destroy the Kshatriyas. And that's what actually happened to Vishwamitra Muni. He was defeated by Vishishta Muni. So he's thinking, I'm going to be a Brahmin. It's better. The Kshatriya business is not getting me anywhere. So in order to become a Brahmin, he decided to meditate. And so he was going to perform the meditation, which is practically impossible. In the winter time, he sat in ice cold water up to his neck and he performed meditation. Freezing cold water in the winter time. In the summer time, he sat in the middle of seven fires surrounding him and in the middle of the hot sun during the, hot, the hottest part of the day and started to meditate. He became so expert at controlling his mind, he was fixed. But then Indra, Indra was thinking, he's trying to get my kingdom. <laughs> he's trying to perform austerities in order to get elevated to a better position. And my, my position as king of heaven is under, is under threat. So Indra sends one society goal, girl. Who was that? Rumba? Oh, no, that was the second. Who was the first one? Menaka. Menaka. And she comes and she's, you know... Society girl, she's very nicely dressed, very beautiful by material standards. And she's got her, simply, he didn't even see her. He heard her ankle bells tingling. And the sound of these sweet tingling ankle bells diverted his attention away. He saw Menaka and he thought, hmm, time to move on in life. <laughs> so he decided, well, you know, that's enough of his meditation. <laughs> And so his meditation broke, he married Menaka. Of course, that's a famous pastime because there's a story of the daughter that was born to Vishwamitra Muni and Menaka, and that was Sakuntala. There's a, that story of the life of Sakuntala was the daughter of Vishwamitra Muni and Menaka. But after some time, he was thinking, boy, I was a powerful yogi. Now look at me, you know, I have to wash the dishes, you know. That's enough of this stuff. <laughs> I'm going to back, going back to be a yogi again. So again, he performed his, and this time he was thinking, I'm not going to fall down. No way. They, Indra can do whatever he wants. <laughs> and so he got into his meditation again, and Indra, you know, wasn't going to give up. So he sent Rumba, right? That was Rumba was the second one. She came, and she was also doing her thing, but this time, Instead of becoming attracted to her, he became angry when he saw her. And he had the power of his meditation that he could shoot fire from his eyes. And the fire burnt Ramba to, you know, to a cinder. She was nothing left of her. She was, you know, part of the, the yagya. <laughs> kind of a, you know, we call a mana yagya. <laughs> so, then, because he was averse to, to her coming and trying to attract him, he fell down again. 
Aversion and attraction are two sides of the same coin. In the beginning, when we practice Krishna consciousness, it is good to develop a type of aversion towards the objects of sense gratification. But we can't stay in that practice too long because that aversion will again turn into a type of attraction and therefore one has to develop attraction for Krishna. <laughs> Only by becoming attracted to Krishna can the mind become fixed in devotional service. Otherwise, even if we are engaged in devotional service, if we're not attracted to Krishna in devotion, it can easily also be diverted to sense objects. So one has to develop their attraction for Krishna. And it's not, it's not hard to become attracted to Krishna because Krishna is Krishna. And Krishna means what? All attractive. He can attract everybody. Even Cupid tried to attract Krishna. Narnarayan Rish came and he was the... Uh, he was the embodiment of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And then, what was it, Indra with all the society girls again? And Cupid came along, the whole, the whole gamut, they all came to disturb Nayan Narayan Rish. But Nayan Narayan Rish just, uh, just glanced at them and they were all finished. <laughs> I was just reading yesterday, Mark and Dea Rishi, same thing. Mean, he had performed such austerities and penances. He was so absorbed that he had attained complete meditation on the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Indra's active again. You should remember this. If you become too advanced in devotional service, be careful. Indra's thinking, oh no, we got to do something. And this happens all the time. I remember even in Krishna consciousness, devotees say, yeah, after practicing so long in Krishna consciousness for years, there's my old girlfriend before I was a devotee. She comes back again. Oh, no. <laughs> so it happens like that. There was one devotee. He was a sannyasi for 35 years. And before he joined the movement, um, he was married, and he had a four-year-old daughter at the time. He left his wife and his four-year-old daughter, joined the Hare Krishna movement, practiced seriously devotional service, became one of the best scholars in our movement. And after 35 years, his, his daughter came back and said, Hello, Father, do you remember me? <laughs> I was only four years old when you said goodbye. I'm back. And she's smoking cigarettes, you know. She wants to associate with her father. <laughs> so it was, you know, so you should understand that as you make advancement in Krishna consciousness, Maya will find different ways by which to allure you back to the, spirit, the material energy, just the way Maya is. Yeah. That's her job. You can't blame her. But Indra uses these material energy. So he was trying to divert uh, Mark and Dea Rishi. He came with spirit springtime personified with all of these beautiful girls along with Cupid. Cupid himself came to help Indra. And the whole, the whole beautiful scene came in the atmosphere of the hermitage of Mark and Dea Rishi. And Cupid is all ready to shoot his arrows and the girls are singing and dancing and displaying all kinds of beautiful, you know, uh, uh, postures. Mark and Dea Rishi, nothing. <laughs> he kept his, and then Cupid thought he had him. So he shot his, what we call, arrow. <laughs> <laughs> Gets hit in the heart. Nothing happened, the, harp, the arrow just bounced off. It was like nothing. Cupid had, Cupid thought, all right, I'll use a better arrow. Nothing happened. So each time, and then Indra thought, my God, who is this Mark and Dea Rish? And I gave everything on that one. I sent the best girls, Cupid himself, springtime. The atmosphere was just suited for romantic atmosphere with Mark and Dea Rish. So this is the power that one can attain in devotional service, but one has to very carefully 
control the mind because the mind is flickering. Chanchalahi mana krishna pramati balabhadridha. It's a very... So one has to watch the mind. Prabhupada said, keep, keep watch on your mind and don't let the mind take you where it wants to go. You have to take it where it, well, it, well, you want to go. And that can only be done by strong intelligence. Sometimes devotees ask, what's the difference between the intelligence and the mind? What is the functions between the two? Well, the mind will simply attach itself to whatever it likes. And the whole process of the mind is to accept something and reject something. Sometimes it accepts something nice, just like somebody becomes attracted to something and then the next day that same attraction is not there for the same object. So the mind is like that. Uh, sankalpa, vikalpa. Accepting something, rejecting the same thing. Accepting something else after some time, rejecting the same thing. And this is the, the nature of the mind. But the intelligence has to be fixed. And the intelligence has discrimination and determination. By discriminating how to, to direct the mind in the right way, one can be determined to direct that mind towards the goal of life, which is ultimately devotional service to Krishna. I, so the intelligence has to be strong, so we have to fortify the intelligence by transcendental knowledge. Therefore, we have to study these books very carefully and understand how to apply this knowledge in a practical sense. And when that's done, then the intelligence becomes the friend and the mind will, will become easily controllable. For one who is fixed in devotional service, even if they're in... <laughs> Prabhupada was in New York City one time. He came in just from the airport. So one reporter, you know, like they always like to test Prabhupada. These were the old days when Prabhupada was just beginning his movement. So uh, the devotees uh, were worshiping Prabhupada as he came from the airport. And they had a nice kirtan. They even brought a Vyasasan to the airport. Can you imagine him? This is what it was like in the old days. They would bring, they would, they would, they would like to bring the whole temple if, if they could. <laughs> and just to greet Prabhupada. And the, the emotional outbursts and the kirtan was just all so ecstatic. Those, those days the airports were wide open. It was considered uh, not public, it was considered public area. Now they've changed all the rules because of the Hare Krishnas. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> So we used to come in and do big kirtan. So Prabhupada was there, and uh, they gave him a vyasa sign. Prabhupada was sitting on the vyasa, he accepted some worship. And the reporters were there to find out more about our movement. So one part, reporter was getting disturbed seeing all of this you know, opulence be given to Prabhupada. So he said, he said to Prabhupada, why do you have to sit on that seat? <laughs> And Prabhupada looked at him and said, hmm, the difference between you and me is I can be in a room full of naked women and not be disturbed. <laughs> and all his colleagues were, la colleagues were laughing at him. And he was embarrassed and he couldn't say anything else. So Prabhupada was giving me that. That one on the transcendental platform is a different person than those in the, who are, what we say, moved by the mind, the senses, and the intelligence. So Prabhupada was making a point using his own, ex his own uh, example to say that one, a spiritual person or one who is fixed on the lotus feet of the Lord is not part of this world. <laughs> They're connected with Krishna in the spiritual world. But one should never trust the mind. Mm -hmm. Prabhupada gives this nice lecture. He said, don't ever trust your mind. He said, always mistrust. That doesn't mean you don't use the mind, but always check to make, make sure what the mind is telling you at the particular time it's happening. Otherwise, it can lead you into the wrong uh, area. So Prabhupada explains that very carefully. He said, once one is able to control the mind, one should watch the mind, just like one who captures a wild animal does not want that wild animal 
to again become loose because it could do harm to so many, including the person who captured it. So he keeps great watch on that mind. So in the same way, yeah, so in the same way, one has to watch the mind very carefully. Otherwise, the mind can, you know, go anywhere and everywhere. So uh, in the Bhagavatam, it explains that Prabhupada gives so many different formulas and messages, and he speaks a lot about this in Krishna in his in his lectures and his books. And in one verse, um, it's, to, it's in the fifth canto, seventeenth chapter. No, I'm sorry, fifth canto, eleventh chapter, verse number seventeen, the last verse in that particular chapter. There is some statement about the mind. And in the very first statement in the purport, Prabhupada said, there's one easy way to control the mind. Neglect. Don't listen to it. Especially when you're chanting japa, right? <laughs> you're trying to chant japa and the mind is going, you know, everywhere, you know. <laughs> It's going all around India, everywhere, different places, visiting this person, trying to solve this problem, going this way and that way. That's the nature of the mind. So learn how to neglect the mind. And by doing that, one can, just like if you're, you know, if you're a parent or a mother, you're taking care of children. And sometimes you have a two little, a little, two or three year old child and then it wants to run around the house and do so many things and you have to watch the child so it doesn't do anything wrong or break anything or get hurt. But after some time, uh, you know, the child keeps coming up and pulling on the mother's sorry, mother, I want this, I want this, I want this, I want, and the child, mother's trying, and then the mother after a while just doesn't pay attention to the child. <laughs> and then the child just, becomes quiet. <laughs> He's not getting anywhere. So it's learning how to neglect the mind and the mind will always tell us, yeah, hmm, yeah, you could have been at a movie instead of the Hare Krishna temple. <laughs> it was a good movie and it's the last day they're playing too, you know, so. So the mind is always giving us some kind of, um, some ideas what we should be doing, so. Therefore, the, the point here in this verse, which is very important, is that gradually keep purifying that mind through the process of devotional service, the mind becomes fixed on Krishna. When the mind takes, then mind can take one back to Godhead. And as Prabhupada mentions here, then there's no more birth in this material world. Because it's the mind that takes us from one body to another body to another body, another body, another body. As long as there is still some desire to enjoy this material world, that desire motivates uh, the energy that is connected with a particular mode of material energy, usually the mode of goodness, passion, or usually passion or ignorance. And then one takes a birth according to that, the quality of that desire that one still has at the previous life. So well, therefore, one has to be free from all material desires and focus completely on... And how does that done? The easiest and most ed quickest way is satam prasangam mamavirya sambhido bhavanti ritkarna rasayana kata. By hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord, if we become absorbed in hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord, then the mind actually develops the higher taste. And when that higher taste is there, then the mind becomes fixed and only devotional service and especially hearing and chanting the, 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 the glories of the Lord. Just like a couple of years ago, um, uh, when we had the lockdown due to the coronavirus, Devotees couldn't go to so many places. So many devotees just started to study the books. Some book devotees were writing books. <laughs> and devotees were chanting more rounds. It was a great time. <laughs> we had more time for sadhana. We had more time for hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord. And so many wonderful things happened. And devotees who were not so healthy became healthy. <laughs> because we didn't have to travel for a long time. <laughs> uh, so, you know, 
devotees know how to turn an apparent difficult or very dangerous situation into, you know, how to make progress in devotional service. Personally, you know, when that happened, I just, I just increased my rounds from, from 20 to 32. I was chanting 32 rounds a day. I was thinking, this is nice. Let the lockdown continue, you know. <laughs> Up to a certain point, anyway. You get a little restless after a while, <laughs> but anyways, this, the, the point was then the mind has no has when the mind has too many choices, just like we preach in jail, and in jail you don't you're you you're limited in how many things you can actually do, <laughs> and those things you can actually do are not very attractive anyway. So when we're preaching in jail, we find very serious people who come in contact to Krishna consciousness by reading Srila Prabhupada's books, they actually become very serious in their practice of devotional service. And sometimes chant, you know, 32 rounds or 64 rounds a day, read Srila Prabhupada's books. And um, uh, they're fixed because there's, no, there's not too many external sense objects that they can, you know, focus on. Uh, although they still have, may have material desires, they realize that if they can't fulfill them, so they, they somehow or other see the benefit of spiritual life and take to it and, with some enthusiasm. It's only due to a difficult circumstance. So, you know, the idea is that uh, keep that mind connected to the activities of devotional service. And then even when you go to sleep at night, then the mind will reflect something spiritual or something pleasant. If we don't control the mind during the day, then when, when we take rest at night, you never know where that mind's going to go. It could go anyway, from heaven to hell or in between. So it's important because um, the direction of the mind is the quality of our devotional life, our life itself. And when we focus it on Krishna and devotional service, then the, that mind will reveal Krishna automatically through the process of hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord. And then, as Prabhupada says here, the pure soul will be able to return home back to Godhead. Taktva deham purna janmani anaiti mameti sorjana. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, by understanding the nature of my transcendental activities and uh, birth as I appear in this material world, then one automatically is qualified to return to the spiritual world, simply by understanding. But be before we can really understand the activities and appearance of the Lord, we have to hear continuously these activities as by hearing continuously, Krishna reveals himself through his, through his own activities. The more you hear, that's why Prabhupada said, just over and over, just stay connected to transcendental sound vibration. Hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord, because the more you do that, the more the mind becomes fixed, or what we say attracted to the transcendental realm, and then the material energy gradually starts to dissipate. Although it's still present, it has, the le has less and less effect. As we use the example of Srila Prabhupada, he can be in the most, uh, as mentions also in the Bhagavad Gita, that a person can be in the most dangerous situation and still be unaffected by that because their consciousness is fixed. Just like there was a story, I think I told this story before, where Srila Prabhupada sent two devotees, both sannyasis, to Bangladesh in the year 1971, when there was the war in the Bangladesh at that time. So Prabhupada was in India at the time, and so he had sent these two sannyasis to preach in Bangladesh during the war. So it was quite of a dangerous situation, and after some time Prabhupada decided to call them back, thinking that they might, you know, really be in, in a too dangerous a situation. But he couldn't get through. All communications were broke down because of the war. And so the devotees were there preaching. 
And then some of the local people were saying, well, like, it's getting really dangerous here now for any foreigners to be here, so you better leave. And so they decided, okay, maybe it's time to go back to Prabhupada. And the Islamic army at the time, they were arranging for buses for people who wanted to leave the country, like immigrants who were not hostile to their, you know, to their ideas. And so there were buses were going, so these two sannyasis got on the bus. And, um, but the Islamic army were checking the buses as they got to the borders. And then they came on and they saw these two sannyasis there. <laughs> so they pulled them off the bus, put them in front of a firing squad, <laughs> and were about to shoot them. So one of the sannyasis was Brahmananda, one of the first devotees to join the movement. The other one was pushed to Krishna Maharaj. So they're there, and so Brahmananda has his beads, and he just takes his beads out, and he holds it up in the air, and he starts chanting really loud, really loud. And he's saying, we're going to go back to Godhead. We're going back to Godhead. And he was chanting and chanting. And the other said, and he to Krishna Maharaj, God, and he was, yeah, yeah, we're going back to Godhead. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. And the whole army, the Islamic army, at least the, the, the guy in charge, he got bewildered. He said, all right, get out of here, get on the bus and go. <laughs> Put him back on the bus. They simply took full shelter of Krishna and his holy name, and everything changes. As soon as you remember Krishna, as soon as you chant Krishna's name, you're no longer affected by what's going on in this world. If you seriously chant, that ha that's true with anybody. It doesn't matter whether you are a practicing devotee or anyone, because Krishna's name is available to anyone and everyone. We chant Krishna's name, we are with Krishna, we are not affected by what happens in this material world. And as we increase doing that, we become attracted to Krishna. And then when that attraction turns to attachment, attachment it turns to pure love for Krishna. And then your life is perfect. When you, when you know Krishna, you know everything. When you know everything, you don't know Krishna, you don't know anything. <laughs> It's useless because all that knowledge can, can't save you at the time of death. Prabhupada tells the story of the one Westerner, he was a scholar. He had, he had so many PhDs and so many, uh, you know, uh, carriers of education. So he came to India and he was just a little bewildered about India. He didn't know how to function here. So he had to cross one holy river, so he went down to the river. And it was a boatman there, so he understood, all right, I have to take the boat across the river. So there was one simple boatman. He got in his boat, and the man's taking him across the river. And then he's looking at the boatman, and he's thinking, hmm, this man doesn't know much. So he says to the boatman, Mr. Boatman, you, you know, you're, you're doing this every day on the water. Do you know the science of oceanography? And the boatman says, what word is that? <laughs> Oceanography, the displacing of, displacing of water and how it is scientifically understood in terms of quantity and quality, you know, gets into an all. Uh, he said, I don't know anything, I just row my boat. <laughs> all right. Then the, boat, then the scholar says, well, 50% of your life is wasted. Tells that to the boatman. So they're going on for some time, and then he says, you know, you're here sometimes at night, you're riding your boat, there's so many beautiful stars in the sky, do you understand astronomy? The science of, you know, astrological constellations and how everything is situated. He said, I just row my boat, that's all. <laughs> And then the scholar says, well, 75% of your life is wasted. <laughs> so then they're getting, and they're still going along the river, and then there's a big storm comes out, and, the, and it starts raining, and the boat's starting to get filled with water, and it's starting to shake, and the boatman's trying to control it. The scholar's kind of getting really nervous, and then the, the boatman says to the scholar, do you know how to swim? 
He says, no, 100% of your life is wasted. <laughs> so all of his knowledge is useless. <laughs> so when you know Krishna, then you, you, all other knowledge is automatically available if you want it. But if you know Krishna, then you're satisfied. So then one has to train the mind to actually connect with Krishna in devotional service. And that, and that, takes, that takes a lot of time. And I use that word a lot because the mind is not easily tra trained. It, it, we really have to work on training this rascal mind. And learning how to say no to the objects of the senses is one way by which the mind is, becomes easily controlled. Practice saying no to the mind. <laughs> okay, so I'll stop there. Any questions or comments? Yeah, Vishabhanu Prabhu. Is that right, Vishabhanu? Okay, I got it. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much for a very absorbing and wonderful class, Maharaj. Uh, I had uh, one question in my mind. Uh, Yudhishthir Maharaj was actually 100% surrendered to Krishna. Uh -huh. With every thought, word and action, he breathed Krishna. Still, why was it necessary for him to go through this yogic process at the fag end of his life? Just what, what was the need? Why did he take to this, uh, the reverse process? Interesting question. Why didn't he just absorb himself in Krishna? In, which is, he's, he's doing the yoga process, ultimately. Anybody know the answer? I don't. <laughs> I don't actually know why. That's a good question. Does anybody know? Who's, where's all the scholars here? I see so much saffron here. There's got to be some scholars here. Anybody know the answer? Why did he take the difficult process when he could have just absorbed his mind in Krishna? Was he giving it as an example on how to teach the, uh, the conditioned souls how to gradually do withdraw from the material energy? Anybody know the answer? Nobody. Maharaj had an opportunity to give, read the lecture with Chila Prabhupada. That's a very given. good question because, I mean, he's a pure devotee of the Lord. And he's not only Krishna, actually, is serving you to steer. Krishna becomes subordinate to the to the suggestions and commands of you to steer. When uh, Krishna was in Dwarka, you know, you to steer also came that, at that time, and you to steer requested Krishna to come to the Rajasuya sacrifice and be the most uh, exalted person to be honored in that sacrifice. And Krishna immediately agreed just to please King you to steer. Yeah, he had a, they had such an intimate relationship. Thank you, Maharaj. Uh, uh, I had an op opportunity to read a class which was given by Prabhupada uh, on the same verse. Uh -huh. And in that, he, he says that uh, persons like Yudhishthira Maharaj, Bhishma Dev and so many, they knew this yogic process. And, you know, they just knew it and they could practice it at will. That is what uh, Prabhupada says in one of his classes. So I was wondering whether he used the technique just because he knew it or whether it was necessary. That was the doubt that I had in my mind. You have answered, Maharaj. Thank you well, very much. Well, that's, yeah, that's, that's what Prabhupada said. They knew the yoga process. Huh? They took advantage of that. But the, the culmination of the process is absorption into the Supreme. So whether you do it through the process or you do it immediately, the same result is there, or the same, yeah, same conclusion is there. One has to absorb himself in the Supreme. Thank you very much, Mara. Thank you so much. Thank you, Hare Krishna. Anyone else? Any other questions or comments? Okay. Thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai.